Good evening, everyone. We are continuing with the story of David from 2 Samuel. Today, we are looking at two chapters, uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And it's basically about David's sin with Bathsheba. Now, this episode of David's sin happens because he does not do what he should do and he does what he should not do. Sounds confusing, right? A little bit like uh, from Romans, Paul saying, the thing I should not do, I do. Now, this is an issue with people, including God's people. Not doing what they or we should do, but doing what they or we should not do. In David's case, he allows sin to lead him from one wrong to another because he does not overcome the temptation to keep sin at bay. And the basic principle goes all the way back basically to God telling Cain in Genesis chapter 4 verse 7, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. So that is the situation here. And the story is that it is now springtime and it is the time when kings go to war. And David is a king, but he sent Joab and the whole Israelite army out. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. So we see that trouble begins when David does not fulfill his role as king. What is he supposed to do as king? He's supposed to lead his people in battle in the spring. That says here, when kings went to war. But he stays in Jerusalem while he sends Joab out in his place. The army commander goes out in his place. And so we can actually see that when we stop doing what we are supposed to do in our role in the body of Christ, it may indicate something is not right and can in fact lead to something wrong or some form of temptation. You know, when we stop going to church or when we stop doing things that we should be doing as Christians or when we stop fulfilling our ministry role, that can indicate something is not right. And perhaps we are facing some form of temptation. And, you know, we may try to validate or excuse or justify ourselves that, oh, there's nothing wrong with me or the course of action that we choose to take. So this is David at this situation. And so in Jerusalem, one evening, he saw this beautiful woman from the roof of his palace. And then he sent for her. And so he actually wanted to know her personally. And after knowing who she was, he slept with her. And then the Bible was very fast. She became pregnant. And David sent word to Joaf, the army commander, to send Uriah the Hittite to him, because that's the husband. And David sent Uriah to go back home to his wife. But irritatingly, the man slept at the entrance to the palace, so he didn't go home. He would not go home to eat, drink, and lie with his wife while the men are camped at war in the open fields. So this is David not disciplining his eye, his curiosity, and his desire. You see that he forgets himself and he gives in to temptation. First, there is the temptation to find out more. So he sent for her and then to get to know her and then the temptation to be involved with her. So there are three stages of temptation for David. First, the curiosity of finding out more about her. Okay, 
uh, disciplining his eye is a problem because he saw the woman and he was attracted. So he didn't discipline his eye. Then he didn't discipline his curiosity because he wanted to know her. And after knowing her that she is a married woman, he didn't discipline his desire to be involved with her. So stages of temptation from one to the next and finally to committing the wrong. When he gives in to temptation, he loses his sense of wrong. You know, she is a married woman and he does not think that, oh, I should not get involved. But he crosses the line into action and ends up seducing the woman and then committing adultery with her even though he knows she is married. So he lost his sense of wrong at that time because he gave in to the temptation of his desire. And when he hears that woman has become pregnant, he tries to cover up by recalling the husband from the battlefield to go home to sleep with her. But his scheme fails. Uriah does what David would probably do in his place. You see, Uriah is just like David, supposed to be a very honorable man because he refuses to enjoy himself knowing that his fellow men and brothers are still in the field where he should be. They are all engaged in the battle and how can he be enjoying himself at home? So David's cover-up plan fails and in desperation not to be found out, he proceeds to plot the man's murder. But he uses the sword of the Ammonites. And after the husband is killed, he goes on to marry the woman and have the baby. So David wrote to you, I have to put Uriah in the front line of fighting to be killed. And after Uriah died, David married the wife and she bore him a son, a baby. But then what David did displeased the Lord. So here we see that the Bible makes a very clear outright statement that what David does displeases the Lord. He has gone down a slippery slope by deviating from what he would normally do, and that is go to war as kings normally do during spring. And that is his role as king. He's supposed to lead his people to fight the enemy. But here he is at home, and he has not checked himself in committing one wrong after another, breaking one commandment after another. All the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. He broke three commandments out of the ten. And on top of that, he has lied, okay, he has lied by not telling Uriah the truth of what he has done when he recalled Uriah. So in that sense, you can say he is he's, uh, bearing false testimony or another commandment is you shall not tell lies. Yes, and he's trying to cover up his adultery with deceit. To have Uriah be intimate with his wife so that the baby can be passed off as his. So we see that David has abused his position and authority as king. So the sad part is even though he is a godly man, yes, he has crossed the line and he abuses his position and authority as king. He has also involved Yoav, the army commander, to go and get the man killed. And in that way, he has been a bad example to his army commander because the army commander carried out his evil plan. He has killed and dishonored an honorable man and good soldier. He didn't think about it. And final point, very bad, was he has dishonored God. He didn't think about that. You know, he's always a man who puts God 
first. And now he dishonors God because he gave in to temptation. God has blessed him with so much and he has forgotten to be grateful by doing wrong to his fellow men. So that's an important thing to remember. When we do wrong to our fellow men, we are dishonoring God. So the Lord sent Nathan to David and prophet Nathan told him a parable of this rich man who took his poor neighbor's only ewe lamb. Ewe is a female sheep, huh? so his female lamb to prepare a meal for a traveler who visited him. Now this is a rich man. He has a lot of his own sheep and lambs, but he chose to take his poor neighbor's only lamb. So David was angry when he heard the story and he said that the man deserved to die and pay for that lamb four times over because of what he did without any pity. So David didn't realize it, okay, but he's actually judging himself on a few points. Now, David knows Normally, David knows what is wrong. His heart is not so hard and distorted yet that he cannot tell right from wrong. You know, there are people in the world, and sometimes even Christians, their hearts are so distorted and so hardened that, you know, they will do, do not see when they are wrong. And in fact, somebody may say, wow, this guy's so clever, huh? Uh, he goes and takes his poor neighbor's you lamb to prepare so he doesn't have to kill any of his own. You see, save money. So some people can be quite distorted and hardened in their heart towards wrong and can reason something ridiculous like that to the rest of us. But you know, David is still able to recognize it when he hears a story of wrong being committed. He's not so hardened until he thinks that it's okay to take advantage of somebody else. And now, David needs someone to tell him that the one who does wrong in the story is actually himself. He knows what is wrong. He speaks out against the wrong. And he needs somebody to tell him, that is you. When he is in the situation in the midst of making the wrong decision and taking the wrong action, he does not judge the wrong and stop himself from falling into one temptation after another until finally his temptation becomes fulfilled. He knows this man in the parable deserves to die and to make compensation according to God's law. For example, Exodus chapter 22 verse 1 is one of the verses that talks about how you compensate. And he now also knows that he has acted without pity for Uriah, who has been a committed, faithful and loyal soldier in his army. So you see, he says he's able to say that what the man, the rich man did was without any pity. So he knows what is wrong and he can even judge that the man did not show any pity. Which is to say, David himself did not show any pity to the man when he killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. So David really closed his eyes to his own wrong at that time. And you know, like David, most of uh, Perhaps all of us know what is wrong in principle, but we do the wrong anyway. Yeah, that is what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we do the wrong anyway. The wrong that I know I should not do is the wrong that I do. So we are too caught up in our thoughts and emotions of the situation to pull back and stop ourselves. Have you ever got found yourself in this kind of situation? So caught up in your thoughts and emotions that you did not pull back and stop yourself. 
That's a time where we need someone to represent God, to speak to us and confront us with our wrong. And that's why, you know, uh, there are times when we cannot say that people are judging us. What is important is the follow-through. If we allow ourselves to receive the rebuke and the confrontation to get right again, if, even though we may or we will not feel good about it, yes, we probably will feel very bad about it and embarrassed and even ashamed and guilty. But you see, the thing is getting right is very important, more important than the idea of face, losing face, right? Embarrassment and losing face. That's something that for us, maybe as Asians, we need to, we need to reorientate our thinking. Yeah. Not so much on losing face, but doing what is right. Story continues with Nathan telling David he was the man and what God had to say to him. God anointed him king over Israel and gave him everything. But here's the thing that in God's eyes, he despised the word of the Lord. Okay, so these statements are actually given in the Bible to show God's attitude towards man's sin, especially the sin of a godly person. That is all of us as God's children. Yeah, by doing something like that, David despised the word of the Lord, doing what was evil in God's eyes. And by killing Uriah with the sword of the Ammonites and taking his wife, right, he had despised the Lord. So down here, there are at least two very great, important, wrong things David has done. He has committed adultery and then he has killed the men. And he killed the men using the enemies. So that was despising the Lord. And now the Lord tells him that the sword would never depart from his house and God would bring calamity on him out of his household. So David is going to face hard times in the future. Well, we see that God is a holy God. And God, being holy, does not practice favoritism. Even though David is God's anointed king, right? And David is always consulting God. God holds him accountable now for the sins he commits. And these sins will bear consequences. God says what he has done shows he despises the Lord and God's word. We may not realize it, but when we choose to do something wrong to our fellow men and especially to fellow Christians, we are despising the Lord. Whether it is committed by an ordinary person, ordinary Christian or greatly anointed person, Sin is evil in God's eyes and displeases him. So God holds David accountable. That's what we're studying on a Sunday morning uh, Bible study sessions, right? God holds people accountable. And so this is David's turn for committing the murder of Uriah and the judgment of death will fall on his household. So his family. So the certainty is that now tragedy will strike his own family. And this is where uh, David told Nathan he had sinned against the Lord. He admits his sin. And Nathan said the Lord had taken away his sin. But what he did made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. And the son born to him would die. So this kind of sin is very serious to God because it is about the reputation of God to the, shall we say, the non-Christians, the people who need to know God. But you know, God's people shame and put God in disrepute. And the enemies of God will probably not want to worship him. 
non-Christians would not want to worship God if they see that Christians are doing all these terrible things and bringing the bad reputation to God. So the lesson we learn from David's life is he is rebuked. Yeah, he, he realizes and he learns that lesson. It's a hard lesson, but he acknowledges his wrong and repents of his sin. So there are two parts here. First is to acknowledge the wrong and then from there to continue to go forth and repent. That means change. And then Nathan conveys God's forgiveness, but it does not remove the consequence that the baby will die. So there are two, two things, huh? two different things. Forgiveness for wrong does not mean that consequences do not exist. They are two separate things. Forgiveness is for committing the wrong. Okay? Forgive. Somebody forgives you or forgives me because you did something wrong. But that doesn't mean that the wrong things we do, the consequences don't exist. The consequences disappear. They still continue to exist and they will still run the course. Consequences will still run the course where damage must be repaired. You know, you break somebody's window, the person forgive you for breaking the window, but somebody still has to pay for the damage and replacement of the window. So those are consequences. That's not the issue of forgiveness. Or another something more serious, a burst dam. Yeah, if somebody were to bomb a dam and it bursts, you may be forgiven for that terrible act, but then it does not change the fact that now the burst dam will lead to destruction on a massive scale. Flash flood and a lot of things may be lost and destroyed. And sometimes human lives may be part of the uh, collateral damage, the, the casualties. Yeah, so the consequences are separate from the forgiveness. So in this case here, for David, he actually has a psalm, Psalm 51, and he wrote Psalm 51 about this incident. And it states that when the prophet Nathan comes to David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba, what happened? He acknowledges his sin and he prays for God's mercy. Yeah, so forgiveness of sin is one thing and then God's mercy is another thing. He asks God to create a pure heart in him because he has, he has defiled his heart. He has defiled his heart with the sin. So he asked God to now cleanse and purify, create a pure heart in him, and then renew a steadfast spirit within him. So he wants his spirit in him to be steadfast, to be firm. And then also for God not to cast him away from God's presence. So he doesn't want God to keep far away from him or take his Holy Spirit from him. So these are the things that David talks about. David talks about in Psalm 51, right? Asking God for that mercy to create a pure heart in him, renew this steadfast spirit so that he will not waver, he will not sin and waver and God will not cast him away from his presence or remove the Holy Spirit from within David. Remember, he has an anointing. Just like Christians today, we all have an anointing and the Holy Spirit lives in us. So he doesn't want the Holy Spirit to be removed from him. So that is God, is David is asking that the Holy Spirit does not leave him. He is guilty. Now, this idea of guilty has two parts. 
one part of guilty is you're guilty of something wrong, committing something wrong. So it's a state. It's a state of being wrong that is guilty. For example, it's guilty of committing murder. So that's a state. Guilty is also a feeling. Yeah, so you can feel guilty. So guilt has two parts. One is the state of wrong and one is the feeling. So David is guilty and he is convicted of wrong. He feels bad naturally and that's why he needs restoration. He wants to be restored. He wants God to restore, put back to him that joy of his salvation because he has committed murder. That's a very serious thing. And God to grant him a willing spirit to sustain him. So David realizes and has gone through the struggle of knowing that he has done wrong to God and to God by doing wrong to a very good soldier. Yes, an honorable soldier. Right? He has been a committed, loyal and faithful soldier in his army. He didn't he refused to go back home to his wife and he slept at the palace door because he felt that he should not be enjoying himself. So this was a very honorable man. Okay, so with this kind of situation that the son would be born to him would die, David could only depend on God's mercy, right? Not just for himself, but also for the baby. He pleaded with the Lord for the child. Sadly, on the seventh day, the child died. When David was told about it, he stopped fasting and weeping. He was weeping and fasting, right? But when he heard the child died, he stopped fasting and weeping. He knew that the baby would not return to him, but he would go to the baby one day. So he's turned his attention to comfort his wife, Bathsheba, and that's where they had another son and named this son Solomon. And that's a very famous name that we know who will play a very important part later in the Bible story. So David knows he has committed wrong, but it did not stop him from hoping and praying that besides granting him forgiveness, God will also spare the baby's life. Okay, so he realizes that this is really God's mercy if God is willing to give it to him, right? But you see, this disgraceful thing that David has done brings contempt on God. Yeah, it is a bad testimony to the enemies. Yeah, he has, what he has done made the enemies show utter contempt. Okay, so he has brought contempt on God and no matter how David pleads with God, the child dies. So here's the thing about God's reputation. It happened also with Moses. If you remember Moses in the desert, he struck the stone to bring water instead of obeying God to say, talk to the rock so that it will give water. So that time God held Moses responsible for not upholding his honor, God's honor and God's glory in front of the Israelites. And he did not allow Moses to enter the promised land. And also that was the idea where the Bible shows very clearly when somebody, a, a godly person brings contempt on God. Yeah, and dishonors God's glory. And this is what happened with David. And so uh, he couldn't save the child, right? The consequences are such. And then knowing that the child has died, David stops. David stops pleading, fasting and weeping and returns to his regular, regular life. And his attendants are all shocked and surprised. I didn't write it here, but you can read the chapter uh, for yourself in detail, okay? Read the read the Bible for yourself for the details. 
And they were all shocked that, oh, one moment he can be crying, pleading, fasting, weeping, and so on. But the next moment, he can just get up and become so normal. So they thought something is wrong with him. How come he can just stop? He can just stop and then return to his regular life. Well, David knows that, you know, there is nothing we can do about the loved one who has died. Life must go on. Life must go on. There is nothing we can do about the loved one who has died. And also, our, our loved ones, like maybe our parent or our spouse or our child or somebody we really love and treasure, that person dies, yes, and there's nothing we can do for that dead person. There's nothing we can do about the dead person. So you, you can have your funeral, the most beautiful, expensive funeral. It makes no difference to the dead person. But, but there is a need to pay attention to the ones left behind. So when a loved one dies, there is need to pay attention to the ones who are left behind, the people who are still living, right? We don't do things for the dead because they cannot respond, they cannot appreciate, they cannot get angry. But we have to do things and consider for the ones who are left behind. And so David comforts his wife. He knows that death is part of life. You can't avoid it. The fact is the baby will not come back, but he will meet the baby one day. And so this is an indication to give hope to Christian parents. You know, that the child that has not reached the stage of being able to receive Christ for himself or herself has gone home to the Lord. Yeah, because David says that the baby will not return to me, but I will go to him one day. Which is to say that he must have gone to the Lord because when David dies, he will go to the child where the Lord is. So we find that through what David says, we have an eternal destiny with God and those who also call him Lord and walk in his path. For the young children that have no chance of receiving Christ because they are not able to make that decision, right? the Christian parent can be assured that the child has gone home to be with God. But death is not the end for those who are God's kingdom citizens, those who have received Christ and walk with him. Death is only a temporary separation. While we may grieve because of the loss we suffer, we also have reason to rejoice because we will be reunited in the eternal kingdom. So there is grief, but there is also rejoicing. There's also joy, okay? And God's people must show and uphold this balance between the pain and the grief of separation and the joy of the loved one being in paradise. That is the testimony that we have to uphold and show the balance so that the world will see that yes, we have lost somebody while we are in this world, in this life, but we are looking forward to the time when we will all be in paradise and full of joy. That is the testimony that Christians have to uphold to show the world that there is hope, there is life after death and it is eternal life. It is a testimony that every child of God must maintain to offer hope and joy to every person, especially those who do not know or do not have the certainty of this reality, this truth of God. So we must live it and we must show it and we must share it so that people who don't know will know and can also have this certainty for themselves.
Well, the good thing is the Lord loved this baby, this baby Solomon, and sent the prophet Nathan to name him Jedidiah, meaning loved by the Lord. So David and his wife Bathsheba, they return to normal life. You see, once the first baby is dead, there's nothing they can do. They have to go back to normal life. And that's where they have another son, which they name Solomon. And even though this son is born out of a marriage that should not have happened in the first place, God loves that child. Okay? The child is not responsible for what the parents did. And in any case, God has forgiven David. God does not hold the wrong of the parents against the child. Moving on to chapter 13, you see David's family problems blow up. Okay, this is the consequence, the beginning of the consequences of what God told David earlier that... Uh, what God told David earlier through the prophet Nathan that um, tragedy will strike his own family, right? God would, the sword will never depart from his house and God would bring calamity on him out of his household. And so in chapter 13, this is the reality happening. Being a great accomplished and or important person does not automatically make an individual a good parent, friend, or spouse. Okay, this is a reality. Somebody who is great, who is important, who is accomplished, maybe even as president or CEO or whatever it may be, right? Just because that person is great or important, it does not automatically mean that person will be a good parent or that person will be a good friend or will be a good spouse. So we all have to learn to be a good spouse or a friend or good parent, you know, uh, besides being an important or accomplished or great person. These may be our gifts and our abilities. Yeah, being great, being accomplished or being important may be our abilities and achievements. But then being a good parent, friend, and spouse are also uh, relationship skills that we need to learn separate from what we are up here. And that is the same for David. Though David is a great king, warrior, and leader, he is a poor father. He's not a, ve he's not a very good parenting uh, person. You might say that, oh, it is his busy life of fighting battles and other responsibilities of being king that made him have little time to be a father of influence to his own children. So that is the thing that we must always remember because generation after generation, parents, both mothers and fathers, make that same mistake. Yeah, parents, both fathers and mothers make that same mistake. They are busy working, they are busy providing for the children, but they neglect the children. So through all cases, we learn that time must specially and purposefully be made to nurture any relationship. Okay, that's something that we need to remember. Time must specially and purposefully be made to nurture any relationship. Whether time as a parent, time as a child, time as a spouse, time as a lover, time as a friend, time as a colleague, and so on. Yeah, Human relationships. You see, all these great, accomplished, important people doing work, it's about work, but this is about relationships, yeah, and yeah, some people's work is relationships like counsellor, yeah, counsellor can be a, can have relationships as the work, but here it is about relationships in your life 
personal relationships. God's pronouncement that the sword will never leave his household begins among his children from his multiple wives. You recall an earlier session I said David follows society of his time. Yeah, the society that allows multiple wives. And so David had multiple wives and now multiple wives, sorry, multiple wives with different children, right? Children of different mothers lead to family problems quite a lot of the time. May not be 100%, but certainly a lot, a lot of cases. Well, the story starts with David's son, Amnon, falling in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, also his son. So here you have two, three children from two different wives. Amnon is the first son, so the first wife. And then you have Absalom and Tamar from the fourth wife. Then we have Yonadab, son of David's brother Shemia, was Amnon's friend. So they are cousins, uh, cousins to the brother's side. They are David's brother. So he gave Amnon the idea to get to see Tamar and be with her. So Amnon pretended to be sick. And then he asked David's permission for Tamar to go to his house to prepare food for him. And there he raped her and ended up hating her more than he had loved her. So sad ending to this love story. What we see here is Amnon does not know how to manage his romantic feelings for his half-sister. So he takes advice from his cousin and friend, Yonadab, to get Tamar to be close to him. That, that is how people in love uh, want to react. They want to be close to the person they love. Friends can be a good support to talk to when people have issues. But not all the suggestions friends give are good advice. So here, Yonadab gave him advice on how to get close to Tamar. But Amnon goes with his feelings and guts so that he can have Tamar together with him. And he goes ahead with his friend's suggestion and he lies to his father that he is sick and he wants the stepsister or rather the half-sister, to uh, make some food for him. But Amnon does not have the personal maturity or understanding of what love means. You see that his version of love has no respect for her. He just takes advantage of the situation to rape her. And it turns out to be infatuated love. So he doesn't have the maturity or the understanding of love. And because his love was an infatuated love, it was just intense but short-lived passion or maybe admiration. And after he has satisfied his lust, he finds that there is no love but hatred instead. So he has not actually loved her the way true love is. It was just infatuation. But David, as the father, is not in the know about his children. His son does not confide in him. And in good faith, as the father, he gives Amnon permission to have Tamar, the half-sister, go to his house, not suspecting Amnon's motives. So, when King David heard about what happened between Amnon and Tamar, he was furious. And you know, for us reading this story, interestingly, the Bible refers to David as King. King David. It doesn't say David. It says King David. And this suggests to us the way that David looks at it, the way David handles it. It is an 
impersonal monarch subject relationship and manner of taking the news of what happened between his flesh and blood, his two children. When David finds out about the wrong that Amnon has done to his daughter Tamar, he is angry, he is furious, but he does nothing. There is no fatherly action. It is just as if like he is the king and the king heard that a subject committed something wrong and he just left it to the subject's family to go and settle it. But he as king, he doesn't involve himself. It is just like that. There is no fatherly action. Now, whether out of misguided, doting love, or whether it's out of helplessness, or some other reason, he fails to take action to discipline his son. So there could be background reasons that we may not fully understand. But David does not do anything to his son. He does not talk to the son. He does not discipline his son. That proves to be a mistake. Now, Tamar went to live with the brother, Absalom, in his house, a desolate woman. So she becomes depressed. She lives as a depressed, broken woman in the brother's house. Just a shadow of herself. Absalom hated Amnon and killed him two years later because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. What happened was, two years later, so he waited for revenge for two years, he managed to persuade the king. Once again, the king, you know, has the wool covered over his eyes. So he managed to persuade the king to let Amnon and the rest of his sons go to his sheep shearing and celebration, wool cover over his eyes. Sorry for the pun. Yeah. Sheep shearing and celebration at Baal Hazor near the border of Ephraim. Now, Absalom's men killed Amnon on his order, and the rest of the king's sons, they all got a big fright and they all fled. They all ran away in case they got killed. So, we see that the wrong of Amnon does not end there. Because David does nothing about Amnon, Tamar's brother Absalom harbors hatred for Amnon that is never addressed or resolved. Absalom just kept the hatred in his heart on and on for two whole years. David also does not do anything to console Tamar over her rape. So David as a father is really lacking. He didn't, as far as we know, he didn't console Tamar. He also does not consider how Tamar's rape impacts the brother Absalom. And Absalom, having his sister live in his house and seeing how desolate and miserable she remains, you know, how depressed she is, Absalom cannot help but nurse and nurture his hatred for Amnon over two years. And in that time, he plans and he arranges the situation and details to perfectly present a, an opportunity to kill Amnon and avenge his sister's humiliation. So we see that strong negative passions like anger, resentment, bitterness, hatred, envy, rejection, disappointment. What else do you have? What else do we have? Strong negative passions that are unresolved. Especially if we keep it for a long time, it becomes a mental obsession. Yeah, it's something that the mind keeps actively dwelling on, you know, thinking and thinking and thinking on the issue, on the relationship, on the person or persons, and cannot give up or rest. It's like being caught in a trap that goes round and round. The thoughts are caught in a vicious repeating cycle. Just keep going round and round. 
And for Absalom, they lead to an obsession to make Amnon pay. He must pay and pay with his death. And that is what Absalom lives for until the thoughts, the plan, the emotions are fulfilled. Now, this is a godless existence. Yeah, he doesn't have God in his thoughts and in his plans and his emotions. He has all these negative things. So he killed Amnon and the report came to David that Absalom had struck down all the king's sons with no one left. And clearly we see the rest of the king's sons fled, but the news was no one left. The king and his servants tore their clothes, but Yonadab told him that only Amnon was dead. Absalom had the expressed intention, Absalom had been talking about it, to kill Amnon ever since the day he raped his sister Tamar. So it has really been a long time that Absalom has been keeping that intention. What we can learn and see from this part of the story is that inaccurate, distorted and fake news is so easy to pass on. Yeah, nowadays we talk about fake news, right? And we talk about disinformation. That is not unusual. It's already very common in the Bible. People often do not verify the correct details and they go by their imagination and assumption and a conspiracy theory nowadays we call it. Such lack of care often creates false truths and impressions and can lead to serious problems. Here David is given the wrong truth. It's an oxymoron. Let me put that in brackets. How can truth be wrong and how can wrong be truth? Yeah, he's given the wrong truth that Absalom killed all his sons. Then he's shocked and grieved for what he thinks is the death of all his sons at Absalom's hand. No, the king and his servants tore their clothes. So the idea of marrying many wives and having many children so that if anyone dies, he has somebody to take over as king. Now he has only Absalom left. That's what he, he may think. That's what he may think. But then the so-called good news is when Yonadab speaks up to assure the king, oh, that's not the situation. That's what you hear is not true. This cousin alone has the correct version of news. So they all got into grief, extreme grief, you know, wasted extreme grief, wasted their energy. All along, Yonadab has been in the know directly from Absalom for two years. Absalom has confided in him and he is fully aware of Absalom's intention to kill Amnon and he has, like a good friend, inverted commas, he has kept the secret. As a very shrewd man, we saw that in verse 3, he makes a poor friend. Just now, I said just now, right? That you can have a, a person who is very intelligent in this case, a very shrewd cousin, but he makes a very poor friend. Yeah, very good, very clever cousin, but a poor friend. Even though he's a shrewd man, over a time span of two years, he has not advised or helped Absalom to resolve his hatred or give up the plan to murder his half-brother and add to his father's grief. You see, the problem with Yonadab is that Absalom tells him very frankly. They have very frank, open conversations. And he knows Absalom's hatred and intention. And so he is actually in a position to try to talk Absalom out of it and bring him to some kind of closure or healing of the emotions. But instead, 
he has encouraged Absalom, his friend and cousin, to do what Cain did and give in to the sin that desires to have him. Remember Genesis 4, 7, I started today's session by saying that God told uh, Cain, sin desires to have you, but you must master over it. Right? Sin is at the door crouching to have you. Right? But Absalom does not help Absalom, uh, sorry, Yonadab does not help Absalom to address that temptation and give in to the desires to plan and kill the half-brother. And he's also the one gave Amnon the poor advice to get close to Tamar and put them in an unchaperoned situation of easy compromise and mistakes back in chapter 13, verse 3 to 5. Yeah, so you see that Yonadab is a cousin who is a very shrewd person. He advises Amnon with very bad advice that ended up Amnon raping Tamar. And then now he's also uh, an advisor to Absalom, Tamar's flesh and blood brother. So you see how Yonadab is a very shrewd man, but he's not a very good friend. He's not a very good cousin, right? He's a good listener. He's shrewd, right? And he's able to come up with ideas as a resourceful person. But he's not a good friend who offers godly or edifying advice. An intelligent or even a spiritual person may not necessarily make a good friend or spiritual advisor. That's basically what Yonadab shows us. Yeah, He may be intelligent, right? But he's not a good friend and he's not a good spiritual advisor. And sometimes we find that spiritual people, you know, people who are very spiritual, they may not be a very good friend or a very good spiritual advisor either. They can't, they can't advise. Uh, they can't advise in a good, godly way. And meanwhile, Absalom fled to Geshur, where he stayed with Tal Talmai, the king, for three years. But King David mourned for his son every day. Wow, you see, such a devoted father. The spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom after he was consoled concerning Abnon's death. And so down here is very interesting. Now it says the spirit of the king rather than David's spirit. Okay, so I'll need to highlight this with the spirit of the king. Now, what do we learn or what do we see in this section of the story? Absalom flees to Geshur because that's where his maternal family is. His grandfather, Talmai, is the king there. And you can refer to 2 Samuel 3, verse 3b. B means the second part of the verse, yeah, where it mentions that David married his wife, and this wife, the mother of Absalom, is actually uh, the daughter of king in Geshur. And there, Absalom takes refuge for three years from family who will shield and protect him. So let's talk a little bit about David in his dilemma, in his struggle. In one sense, he is a practical man. Yeah, Earlier, in earlier chapters, whenever he's faced with a situation, okay, and in the death of his first baby with Bathsheba, he was able to get over it quickly to address the practical matter of comforting Bathsheba. Now he accepts and gets over the fact of Amnon's death, something which he cannot help anyway. But concerning Absalom, his father is in a quandary. David is both king and father. I've color-coded king in this dark red and father in this blue. Whatever his reason or excuse, he can only mourn for his son and long to go to him, but not take any concrete action to reunite with Absalom. 
Perhaps David's biggest dilemma is the fact that a murder has taken place in his family and the victim is his son and then the murderer is another son. So both people involved in what happened are his children. How is he to face the situation as father? And how is he to face this, handle that situation as king? What does he do if he were to go to his son in exile? You know, he longs for his son yeah, in spirit. Yeah, he longed to go to Absalom. So what if he goes to the son in exile? Should he console the son or should he rebuke and punish or execute the son? Should he feel and grieve as a father? That's the blue. Or as a king, as a king, should he carry out justice against his son, the murderer? Okay, so how does David reconcile being both father and king when his son is the victim, his son is also the murderer? So David struggles with his own conflicting emotions and desires but he is helpless to resolve them or do anything. God's pronouncement, just now we saw that the sword will not depart from his household for his sin of despising God and taking the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be his own is clearly coming into reality. So how would you, you know, how would you, if you are in David's situation, how would you handle the thing where you have two children, one child kills the other, right? And the other is killed by the child because the child has raped the sister. How would you handle that situation? How would that affect you? Anybody has anything to say? We'll just pause briefly in case anybody has some, some, some insights you want to share. So pretty difficult, right? Okay, so we see that David also is caught in this bind because he knew but he did not address the serious problem two years earlier when his eldest son committed a grievous wrong to his daughter and nip it in the bud. It is a very tough situation when family relationships sour because of what members do to each other. The results may be painful. Then the follow-up, mopping up, resolution and closure will be even harder. But, you know, all these things are necessary, even though they are really painful and really difficult. They are necessary if you want recovery, you want healing, of all that hurts and all the pain. And sometimes it's not physical pain, it's emotional and mental pain. And then reconciliation and restoration to happen. And it's really tough when all these things happen within the same family. Otherwise, bitter relationship problems can and often have a very long shadow in the life of individual members and of even the family as a whole. So here is a scenario of how parental love without the balance of discipline can lead to a tragedy. Even in the family of God's people. So it can be happening among Christians in a Christian family. Yeah, but there is no solution, there's no resolution because the people are kind of like caught in a situation where ah, don't talk about it, oh, so hard to talk about it, ah, let's not talk about it. What is prominently missing in this story of David and his family situation with his children is the place of God. 
Yeah, you, you notice we just read through the whole story. There's no God in that whole situation. Whenever David needed to fight a war or handle a crisis with his men, remember the story of the Amalekites at Ziklag? Amalekites took all his men's wives and property and also his two wives at the time. You know, he needed to handle that crisis. God was prominent in his choices, decisions and actions. And when his baby with Bathsheba was ailing and dying, God was also prominent because he was crying to God for mercy and asking God for forgiveness as well as to spare his baby's life. But within his family affairs, there's this loud silence of God. God seems to be absent. You know, we didn't hear anybody talking about God. We didn't hear David crying to God. And another thing, we don't read any psalm of David. You know, David wrote a lot of psalms. We don't write, read a single psalm of David about his struggle with the family. How much of God is in our personal lives, and especially in the life of family with parents and children? Okay, we stop here for now, right? For anybody who has any insight or any question or reflection you want to make. On, on what we have read in these chapters. So I pause for a moment for you to think through so many things that we have covered so emotionally intense. Alfred, I have a question, brother. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead, John. Uh, so, what should have David done in the uh, family situation? Mm. Uh, first, the uh, yeah, his personal his personal uh, problem with. Uh, the son that was born with Bathsheba. Uh, okay. Uh, then it was uh, the son raping his half-sister and he did not uh, uh, do anything, I think. Yeah. And the third is uh, another son killing the other son. Yes. And he grieved and he, uh, what is it supposed to have done uh, that would be, uh, that would, uh, that would have God in the picture? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, John. Okay, first of all, if you talk about the baby that died, there's actually nothing he can do because it's totally out of his hands right? Totally out of his hands because the baby, he cannot heal the baby and he can only pray for God's mercy, which he did. Yeah, down here, he hopes and prays that besides being given forgiveness, God will also spare the baby's life. And then he fasted and wept and he prayed and he even uh, put him, he threw himself on the ground, right, to humble himself. Uh, so that is something very clear-cut, cannot do anything about. But then in this case here where the son, the first son rapes the uh, half-sister, he heard about it and he was furious, right? But we don't hear anything being done. And that's a very good question. What should he have done? Okay, when you ask that question, one person comes to my mind about, what David could have done, and that is Job. 
right? Job, you remember Job? What happened with Job was that when his children, they have a meal or they have a feast and they celebrate, and then after that, Job would normally, uh, Job would normally uh, present a sacrifice on behalf of his children because he may, he may think that in case my children have sinned against God. Okay, so that is in Job chapter 1, verse 5. Right? Let me read it for you. When, when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Them means his seven sons and three daughters. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So Job, as a father, gives us the pattern of fatherhood, and that is to bring the children, to intercede for the children, and to bring the children to the point of acknowledging and repentance. Yeah. So in this case, what David failed to do was to go to Amnon to address his wrong and to bring him to repent. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. But the Bible simply tells us he heard about it, he was furious, but there is no indication of anything else that he has done except feel angry. And when it came to the sister, he also, or rather came to his daughter, Tamar, he also did not do anything about her. She lived in the brother Absalom's house, right? Uh, the whole two years until Absalom went to kill Amnon, and we didn't hear anything about Tamar anymore. So David did not address Amnon to bring him to repentance, and David did not address Tamar to bring her to uh, closure over her grief, and also he did not do anything about Absalom as the flesh and blood brother of Tamar. Okay, so hope this is uh, this answer helps. He should have addressed Amnon to bring him to make a sacrifice of repentance, and he should have also brought Amnon perhaps to reconcile with Tamar and get some form of reconciliation and forgiveness. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. And of course, Absalom being the blood, flesh and blood brother of Tamar will definitely need some form of uh, uh, help as well. Okay, so we'll stop here for this session. Uh, and so if you have any take away from this, from this thing, which is very much a very emotional few chapters that we've looked at because it, it concerns relationships. Yeah, it concerns a man-woman relationship between David and uh, Bathsheba. And then it also goes on to addressing his wrong. And finally, it goes on to the family issues within David's own children. Right. And, and so it's really a lot of food for thought because these are very close issues to ourselves as well, because these are about emotions and relationships we can relate to as people in families. Yes. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Bible once again that it speaks to us about uh, emotions, about issues, about struggles, and about family issues that need to be resolved whenever things go wrong whenever things happen that are not happy or that are hurtful. And we pray, Father Lord, that this will speak a very strong yet uh, encouraging word to us, that you are a father who cares and you want to be involved in our family situations. You want to be the God who is not just God of our life, God of our work, but also God of our emotions and God of our family situations. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, that this story of David, which is very tragic, 
will speak to us of the need, perhaps if we have issues within a family, to talk it out and to address it, knowing that these are important things because they can have long shadows cast over many years into the future. And that's just the beginning of the story for David. And so, Father, we commit ourselves to you asking, Lord, that you guide us and you give us the courage and the wisdom to seek resolution and closure where it, these need to be done. We pray and give you glory for all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.